Um, I'm going to share my screen for lecture this morning. Now remember, I posted an announcement. So because y'all chose Monday and Wednesday as your lecture days, we didn't actually lecture on Monday. We just sort of went over the syllabus and the Canvas course. So what that means is I posted a video for the first part of chapter one so that y'all could go ahead and get started. Um, so there were two videos for the first part of chapter one. There was a chapter 1A that was like 15 minutes and a chapter 1B that was about an hour. Okay, so y'all should have watched that by now. So what we'll do today is we'll pick up where the video left off and we'll finish out chapter one today in this lecture. Um, and then next week we'll start into chapter four. Okay, so don't forget that um, we work basically one week at a time. And because we're doing chapter one this week, that means that you will also have some mastering questions that will be due. Remember, those go along with the lecture material. You'll also have your lab that's due. Everything is always due on Sunday by 11 p.m., okay? Um, make sure, I did put some little videos in there throughout the module for chapter one, so it shows you kind of how to download the lab document, how to fill it in, how to upload it again under that Making the Grade tab. So make sure that you watch those. All right. I'm going to share my screen with you. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, we'll pick up here, that um, every Monday and Wednesday we'll meet for lecture at 8.30. On Mondays, immediately following lecture, we'll do, we'll have a lab time. I'm going to go ahead and make some new Zoom announcements about that so that it'll be a separate Zoom link for lab time on Mondays. Um, and essentially what we'll do on Mondays during that lab time is I will go over the lab PDF from the week before. So this week you're working through chapter one lab. Um, and you're doing a quiz on chapter one lab. So that means that it's due Sunday at 11. So on Monday during our lab time, which would be right after lecture time, so around 10 o'clock, um, I will go over that lab PDF document with you. And I'm doing that just to make sure that you have all the right answers so that as you're studying for your lab exam, you're studying the right thing. So I'll go over those documents with you every Monday right after our lecture time, okay? Again, if you can't make it, if you can't watch it live, not a problem, I'll record it and you can watch it when you get a chance, okay? Anybody have any questions? All right, can everybody see? Oh, yes, go I ahead. I have a yeah. question. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe it's my MacBook. I don't know, maybe, I don't know if any other people have a MacBook, but when I download the PDF file and I save it again and I reopen it and I um, fill in the answers or whatever, but when I go to save it, it still be blank. Okay, um, I'm I'm not familiar with Max. So, um, who who is this first? I don't I can't see Andrea. Andrea, for some reason you're not popping up. Okay, Andrea, what's your last name? Wilder. Wilder. Oh, you sent me a message. Okay, um, I, I don't I have not gotten that from anyone else. Um, I'm going to send you, I know we were messaging this morning back and forth. I'm going to send you um, an email after our lecture today, um, an email address of John Alexander. He is mm -hmm. our IT guy and he has a Mac and he's good with Macs. And so I'm going to just go ahead and send you to him because I can't troubleshoot that for you. So I'll give mm -hmm. you his email address so you can reach out to him and hopefully he can troubleshoot that for you. Okay. 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 Let me write this down. Okay, I will do that right when we get off of here, okay? All right. Anybody else have any questions? Um, can you all see my screen? Hopefully you can. Yes. All right, great. Um, can you see what I just wrote on there? I just scribbled. Can you all see that? that too? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Okay, good. So some days um, I'll be lecturing at home. Um, and then there are some days where I will actually drive on campus and lecture from campus. So it just kind of depends um, on my schedule. But just so you know that some days it might look a little different. Um, <clears throat> So the chapter one videos that y'all watch walk through the first part of chapter one. The first part of chapter one and chapter one in general is a very introductory chapter. We kind of walked through what's the definition of anatomy. Um, what is the definition of physiology? So remember anatomy is the structure of the body parts. Physiology is the function, it's how they work. And a lot of times when you take a course, it's anatomy and physiology because you can't really study how something works if you don't know the anatomy, right? You can't study the physiology if you don't know the anatomy. Um, so we talked about that. We also walked through all the organ systems in the human body. Now, you need to know all 11 organ systems. You need to know the organs that are within that organ system and its sort of main function. That's what we walked through at the beginning of chapter one. Um, now, this semester, we are not covering all 11 organ systems. Remember, anatomy and physiology is a two semester course. So we're gonna do about five of them this semester and you'll do six of them next semester. Okay, we're just kind of splitting it in half to get into the nitty gritty, but you should know all 11 in their sort of general organs, general functions. Um, a couple other things that we walked through right at the end of chapter one, the first part of chapter one, those videos, we talked about a term called homeostasis, which is truly how your body maintains a relatively stable internal environment. So how your body is maintaining a stable body temperature, how your body is maintaining a stable blood sugar, um, how you are maintaining a water balance in your body. And so we talked about homeostasis and how you do these things. And I touched on two concepts. I touched on positive feedback and negative feedback. Negative feedback does not mean bad. Negative feedback just means that your body goes in the opposite direction of the original change. So like, for example, if your body temperature starts to rise, maybe you're working out, your temperature's going up, negative feedback means your temperature's gonna come back down and get you back where you should be, okay? If your body's temp temperature starts getting low, Negative feedback means you're going to change it and go in the opposite direction and bring it back up. Okay, so I gave you some examples of that. Negative feedback is truly how we maintain an internal stable environment. Positive feedback is a little different. Positive means we're going in the same direction. Um, so it would be like uh, labor contractions, right? They start out pretty weak, pretty far apart, and then they get stronger and stronger and closer together and closer together, and we keep going in the same direction until we have a baby, right? Um, blood clotting is another example that I gave you. Um, you get more and more and more platelets coming to that broken vessel until you seal the vessel. So positive feedback just means you keep going in the same direction. Negative feedback means you go in the opposite direction. So those are some of the concepts that I talked about in the video. Okay, does anyone have questions on some of those concepts? Hopefully you were able to watch that video. Everybody okay? All right, I will always do sort of a quick recap of what we did the lecture before, before we start for the day. Um, today, we are just going to go over the last part of chapter one. I don't think this is going to take us an hour and a half, um, but this whole last part of chapter one is going to be super helpful for you as you are filling out your lab document. Um, this is called the language of anatomy. So I'm going to minimize my little screen up here. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to walk you through is this term called anatomical position. This is sort of a reference point that we will always use as we describe all the body parts. So whether you are, um, you know, if you are working at a hospital and you are describing body parts in relationship to each other, you would always use anatomical position. Okay, so anatomical position is just like the image you see here. 
So the body is erect. You can see that um, the hands are at the sides, but notice the hands here. The thumb is pointed away from the body. So it's sort of the palms are facing forward, right? The feet, your legs are about hip width apart. Feet are facing forward. This is anatomical position. So it's pretty simple to think about. Now, one thing I want to point out is that, especially when you use the term right and left in anatomy, you're always talking about the right and left of the patient or the person that we're viewing. So when you look at this image, you can see that right that's labeled is the patient's right. It's not your right. And that's really important. You know, if you think about a hospital setting, right, if doctors are going to amputate the right leg, you want to make sure it's the patient's right leg, not the one that's on the right side for the doctor. Okay. So we always use anatomical position. In fact, we always assume this position. And what that means would be like, let's say you are a nurse and you have to write in a chart and you are using some directional terms, anatomical terms, and you have to put the patient in anatomical position. But let's say when you walk in their room, let's say they're laying sort of on their side on the bed curled up. So in your mind, before you start charting, you have to put the patient in anatomical position, okay? So we always use anatomical position. And again, this is really important as we walk through a lot of these different directional terms that I'm going to walk you through. So a lot of these terms um, are just how we describe body parts in reference to each other. So the first one that's listed up here, superior and inferior. I always think, when I think of these terms, I always think of work. I think of my superior, right, someone who is my boss. And so obviously we can think of that as above. And then the term inferior just means below. And so another way we can think of it and the way your book describes it is superior and inferior are toward and away from the head. So let me give you some examples, right? We could say that the heart is superior to the bladder, right? It's above the bladder. So if you could replace the word superior with above, right? The heart is above the bladder. The heart is superior to the bladder. Or you can use the word inferior. So you could say something like um, the stomach is inferior to the heart. Right? It sits below the heart. The term anterior, we can also, in a human, because um, we are bipedal, we just walk on two legs, we can also replace the term anterior with ventral. They mean the same thing. Now, when we're looking at quadrupeds, at four-legged animals, it's a little different. But in a human, anterior and ventral, they both mean towards the front of the body. And again, remember the term front means when we're talking about anatomical position. So if I go back to this picture here, this image that you're looking at, this is an anterior view, right? It's the front view. And then the term posterior and dorsal, again, in humans, in bipedal animals, means the same thing. This just means towards the back of the body. So let me give you some examples of using anterior and posterior in a sentence. So I could say something like um, the esophagus is anterior to the spinal cord, right? It sits in front of the spinal cord. Now you could just flip it around and do it the opposite way for posterior. You could say the spinal cord is posterior to the esophagus. It sits behind the esophagus. Okay. A couple of other directional terms. Um, medial, lateral, and intermediate. These kind of all go together, which is why they're on um, the same slide here. So medial, medial means toward the midline. So if you're standing in anatomical position, let's flop back over here. Let me erase some of this. If you're standing in anatomical position, medial just means the midline, right? So it's something that's gonna be closer to that midline. So let me give you an example. You could say the eye 
is medial to the ear, right? It's closer to the midline than the ear. All right, so another term is lateral. Lateral just means away from the midline or farther from that midline. So let's go back here. So we could swap that and say the ear is lateral to the eye, right? It's farther from that midline than the eye is. And then the last term is intermediate. And this just means between something that's more medial and lateral. So I'm gonna go back to this picture here. And a great example here, we're gonna use the head again and we're gonna say the eye is intermediate to the nose and the ear. Right, it's in between something that's more medial and lateral. Is everybody okay so far on these directional terms? I heard somebody's microphone. Is that a question or are you good? I'm good. Okay, good. Oh, I hear a sweet pea in the background. Okay. All right, the last couple of directional terms that I have on here is um, this one right here, proximal and distal. I'm going to star this because this is the one that gives students the most problems. And the reason is because they use it on the wrong part of the body. So I'm going to circle this right here about 100 times because the only time you will ever use these terms, proximal and distal, is if you're talking about something on the limbs. So the arms or the legs. So notice that as we've gone through all these other terms, I have not used, let's skip back over here, like when we talked about superior and inferior, I didn't use these terms on anything on the arms or the legs of the body. Okay. You would only use superior and inferior when you're talking about the trunk of the body. Whereas proximal and distal are the terms you use when you're talking about the limbs. You would never use superior and inferior here if you're talking about something on the limbs. So what these terms mean are Proximal just means it's closer to the point of attachment and distal means it's farther from the point of attachment. So what's the point of attachment, right? If you're looking at your arms, the point of attachment is going to be the shoulders. So let's use these terms first on the arms, okay? So proximal means it's closer to the shoulder. Distal means it's farther from the shoulder. So I could say something like this. I could say the elbow is proximal to the wrist, right? If you think about it, your elbow is closer to the shoulder than the wrist is. So the elbow is proximal to the wrist. If I use distal on the arms, I could say my fingers are distal to the wrist. Right? They are farther from that point of attachment than the wrist is. Okay, so proximal just means closer to, distal means farther from. Now, if we're using this on the legs, the point of attachment for the legs is going to be the hips. So let's use these terms on the legs. I could say something like the ankle is proximal to the toes, right? It's closer to the point of attachment than the toes are. Or I could say something like the toes are distal to the ankle. Right? They are farther from that point of attachment than the ankle is. Does that make sense? Does proximal and distal make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Anybody have questions on that one? Because that is the one that gets super confusing for people. Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. All right, so proximal, distal, only use them on arms and legs. And then the last directional terms are superficial and deep. And you, I'm sure, have heard these terms before. I always think of wounds when I think of superficial and deep, right? Like a superficial wound or a deep wound. So superficial just means that it's, cl it's closer to the surface of the body. And deep means it's more internal. Okay, so like a cat scratch would be a superficial wound. 
whereas um, a gunshot would be a deep wound, right? So it is important that you know all these directional terms that we just walked through. Okay. And in your lab this week, there are some directional terms where you just have to identify these different terms using an image. Another thing that you'll be doing in lab this week is you'll be going over regional terms. So this is the image from your book of all these different body regions. Obviously, this image right here is an anterior view, right? So remember the term anterior just means front of the body. Okay, so we're looking at the front of the body here. And all a regional term is, is it's just sort of the anatomical way that we describe body parts, right? So like, for example, instead of saying that this is your forehead, we say that's the frontal region. Instead of saying this is the chin, we say this is the mental region. Um, I always remember the mental region because I think of, um, I think it's in Italy, there's the statue of, um, I think it's called the thinking man, where he's like the naked guy sitting on a rock with his hand like up on his chin. So I always remember thinking is a mental process, right? When you think, you put your hand on your chin. So mental, okay? So it is important that you know, now I'm not gonna sit here and just walk you through every single one of these terms. You can read and you can see where these are, but it is important that you know all these terms. All of these regional terms are gonna come in handy for you if you know these, especially when we get into bones and bone markings, because you're gonna see a lot of these terms reappear when we get to bones and bone markings. Okay, so make sure that you know all these terms. Again, this is the anterior view. This is an image from your book. And here is the posterior view, right? And remember, posterior just means back of the body. So you can see all of these in the back of the body. Now you have some images in your lab this week where you'll have to label these. Again, you can find all these pictures in your book. Another thing I wanna walk you through is um, something that are, is called body planes. So a body plane is essentially how we can cut the body into different sections and examine it different ways. Um, so like, for example, now, I mean, we can think of like, if you have a cadaver and we're studying body parts, we can cut them obviously and look at them um, from different ways. But also when we take images, like MRI images, for example, when you have an MRI done, it slices the body into certain planes, okay? So there are a couple planes I'm gonna walk you through. These are the most common. So the very first one is called a sagittal plane. Sagittal means we're going to cut that body into a right and a left. So it would be like just taking a knife right down the middle of your face into a right half and a left half. Now we can actually have different kinds of sagittal planes. If you do it right down the middle, we call that mid-sagittal or medial, okay? If you do it just off to the side, right? So let's say you cut your face over here to kind of down your eye into a right and a left half. It's not exactly into equal right and left halves, but it's still into right and left halves. We call that parasagittal, okay? It's just offset from the midline. We also have a frontal or a coronal cut. This is a type of cut where we would cut the body sort of down the side and the body would fall into an anterior and a posterior half, okay? So it divides the body into a front half and a back half. And then we also have transverse, horizontal, or cross-section. They all mean the same thing. Um, I typically use this term mostly. I call it a cross-section. That's just what I learned when I was in anatomy. Um, and this would be like if we cut the body into an upper half and a lower half, okay? So it divides the body into superior and inferior parts. So I'm gonna show you some pictures here, okay? So these are some great examples. You can see this is a medial cut. We call it median or mid-sagittal. This is when you cut the body into right and left halves, okay? The one in the middle, this is a frontal 
or a coronal cut, and you can see how it's cutting that body. It's cutting it into a front half and a back half. And then the last one, again, I call this one a cross section, but transverse is the same thing. You can see it's cutting the body into an upper and a lower half. Okay, and then you can see down at the bottom, these are some different images, maybe some MRIs, where you can see how it's cut the body into different planes for viewing. Now I'm gonna skip back because the last one I didn't talk about is an oblique cut. These are pretty rare, but they're cuts that are made diagonally. So they're kind of made at a diagonal. We don't see these very often. Um, these are more often used um, during autopsies and things like that. Um, but we can do MRIs from that kind of cut if we need to. So a lot of times when we're discussing these kind of planes of the body, again, it's not that we're actually cutting somebody. It's that this is how we're viewing it using maybe an MRI. So, um, you know, I get a lot of students, especially not so much in, um, I haven't had anybody ask actually in the online class, but I usually will get students that want to know in anatomy, why do we have to dissect stuff? Why do we have to do this? Um, and the reason is right here, anatomical variability. Um, so, one thing that it's really important that you always remember is that we look different on the outside, but we also look different on the inside. And a lot of times um, there are some small structures that are in our body that don't always match the textbook description. Um, so I would say about 90% of the time, the, all the organs in our body look like the textbook description, but 10% of the time, they don't, um, you know, small structures, small muscles, um, vessels, a lot of times blood vessels can be found in slightly different locations or people might have variations. Um, and so it is so important for us that when we get to do these dissections, we see that. Now we're not usually seeing huge anatomical variability when we do dissections, but you get used to the fact that, oh, these things look a little different and I need to be aware of that. So a lot of times when we have the luxury of being face-to-face, -face, especially in a class like AP2, where we dissect rats, I'll have my students, they'll dissect their rats and then I'll say, okay, switch and go to somebody else's rat. And they'll know all the structures on their own rat and then they get to somebody else's and they go, well, this looks really different from mine. That's because of anatomic variability. Or I'll get students that are looking at organs in their rat and they'll move and go to somebody else's and that group might have had a pregnant rat and they are thrown all off because it looks so different. So it's always really good practice for us to just get used to that difference. Okay. Now we don't see extreme variations very often, but some of the cool things that we might find in our specimens that we've seen is obviously pregnancy will change a lot of things, but we've seen vessels be in different locations. We've seen specimens that have tumors or cysts in different areas of the body. Um, so we've seen some pretty cool things. Is everybody okay so far before we get into body cavities? Yeah. Okay. All right, so for body cavities, um, these are spaces that are in our body that are close to the outside, but they are what contain our organs. And so in our body, we have two huge cavities. Um, we have the dorsal cavity. Remember, dorsal just means back. This is on the back of the body. So the dorsal cavity is gonna house things like the brain and the spinal cord, right? The things that are in the back. Then we have a ventral cavity. And remember ventral or anterior means front. So these are the cavities in the front that are gonna house a lot of your internal organs, like your lungs and your heart and your stomach and your intestines. So let's look at a picture of these. So this is an image from your book. And you can see in yellow, right, this is the dorsal cavity. So first let me tell you that you are looking at this image from the side. So this is sort of a lateral view or a sagittal cut, kind of cut right down the middle and opened up and we're looking at from the side. So in yellow, that's the brain and spinal cord there housed in the dorsal cavity. 
then you can see here in red, that's our ventral cavity. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the dorsal cavity and you probably have already noticed from this image there are subdivisions within each of these cavities. So we're going to go through the dorsal, the one in yellow, and its subdivisions and then we'll do the ventral, the one in red, and its subdivisions. Okay, so the dorsal cavity, the one in yellow in the back, obviously it houses the brain and spinal cord, so its main role is to protect the nervous system. Right, I want you to think about it. The brain and the spinal cord, they are housed in the dorsal cavity, but surrounding the dorsal cavity, you have cranial bones, you have your skull bones, you also have vertebrae. So it's incredibly protective because there's bone surrounding the soft nervous tissue. So the cranial cavity is going to encase the brain, and the vertebral cavity is going to house the spinal cord. Now the ventral cavities, these are the ones in red that are in the front of the body, right? Remember ventral means front. These are going to house a lot of your internal organs. Another term for internal organs is the term viscera. Viscera just means a lot of times you might hear me call them visceral organs. Those are all those internal organs right in the front of the body. So there's really in the ventral cavity, there's really two really big divisions. There's the thoracic cavity and the abdominopelvic cavity. So those are the two big divisions. They are actually separated from each other by a muscle called the diaphragm. Does anyone know what the diaphragm does? So the diaphragm is that big muscle in there that actually helps with breathing, right? So the thoracic cavity up top, um, this is also going to have more subdivisions in it. So the thoracic cavity at the top above the diaphragm, think of all the organs up here. There's a lot. Right? You've got your lungs and your heart and your esophagus and your trachea. So you have a lot of stuff up here. So that thoracic cavity can be subdivided further into pleural cavities. You have a pleural cavity on the right and on the left. So there are lateral. They're on the sides and they house the lungs. And in the middle between the pleural cavity is a cavity called the mediastinum. And it's medial, so it's in the middle. And this is going to house things like the heart, the trachea, the esophagus. So that's everything kind of right in the middle that would be found between the lungs. Now I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to add one more in here. Actually, let me put it under here. I'm going to put it under the mediastinum. So <clears throat> the mediastinum in the middle has the heart, the trachea, the esophagus. But if we just want to look at the cavity that houses the heart, that's called the peri. That's not how you spell that. I can't talk and write at the same time. Pericardium. This houses the heart. Okay, so the pericardial cavity or the pericardium is specific to the heart. So I know that's a lot of cavities in there. So let's say I ask you a question. Maybe something like, um, in what cavity do you find the heart? You could tell me pericardial cavity, or you could tell me mediastinum, or you could tell me thoracic cavity, or you could even say ventral cavity. All of those are correct. But if I ask you, in what cavity do you find the heart and be specific? you would say pericardial cavity. Okay, same thing with the lungs. If I said, in what cavity can you find the lungs? You could say pleural cavity, you could say thoracic cavity, you could say ventral cavity. 
But if I said be specific, you would say plural cavity. So when I say be specific, I just mean get to the smallest one you possibly can, okay? Um, so under the, the big old thoracic cavity, just under that, under the diaphragm, you have a big cavity called the abdominopelvic cavity. This is sort of two cavities in one. So if we split them up into their groups, we have an abdominal cavity. The abdominal cavity is big and it's going to house the stomach, the intestines, the spleen, the liver. The pelvic cavity is smaller and it is inferior. It is below the abdominal cavity. Um, and the pelvic cavity is going to house things like the bladder and your reproductive organs. Okay. So together, they're all in the abdominal pelvic cavity, but we can get more specific, right, and say abdominal or pelvic. So if I said, what cavity is the bladder in, you could say pelvic or abdominopelvic. But if I said be specific, you would say pelvic, okay? Now, one thing that I also have on this slide is I'm saying here off to the side that remember, the abdominal pelvic cavity is going to be much more vulnerable to physical trauma than the thoracic cavity. And the reason is the thoracic cavity has bones around it. So you have this nice bony protection around the lungs and the heart. Whereas down in the abdominal pelvic cavity, you no longer have that bony protection. Now you still have protection in the abdominal pelvic cavity in the form of fat. So you do have a layer of fat that covers all of those abdominal organs. This is something that um, you'll have to label in your lab document. It is, um, covers all of those abdominal organs. And then also another form of protection that you do have, not bony protection, but in the abdominal pelvic cavity, you also have your abdominal muscles. So you actually have four layers of abdominal muscles that are also protective. It's protection, it's just not bony protection. And this is why your abdominal pelvic cavity is more vulnerable to physical trauma than the thoracic cavity. Okay, it's lacking the bony protection. So this is an image, this is an anterior view where you can see in red, this is the thoracic, or sorry, this is the um, ventral cavity. So I'm gonna draw a line right here. Here would be the diaphragm. Okay. Everything above the diaphragm is the thoracic cavity. Everything below the diaphragm is the abdominal pelvic cavity. And then we have our subdivisions, right? We have our mediastinum, we have our pleural cavities, we have our pericardial cavity. Down below in that abdominal pelvic cavity, we just split it into abdominal and pelvic. Okay. And in the back, we can see the dorsal cavity in yellow, and we can see the cranial cavity up top housing the brain, and then we can see um, the vertebral cavity peeking out right there. So those are our body cavities, okay? Um, one of the last things I'm going to walk you through is um, a little bit about um, something called serous membranes. These kind of go along with your body cavities in that your organs aren't just sitting in the cavity, they're actually housed within a membrane in that cavity, okay? So those are what are called our serous membranes. Um, in the next chapter, in chapter four, um, we are going to walk through serous membranes and we'll talk about the kind of tissue that we find in our serous membranes. Um, the kind of tissue in there is a tissue that really reduces friction. Right. Friction is not your friend in your body. If you have friction in your body, you invoke the inflammatory response. You get swelling, you get redness, you get heat, you get pain, you get all those things you don't want. Um, and so having some serous membranes that are made of a tissue that really cuts down on friction is important because um, you know, your organs, you don't have space, a lot of space in your body. Your organs are all jam packed together in there. Um, you guys are not doing a rat dissection this semester, but you will do a rat dissection in AP2. And when you cut that rat open and open it up, you're going to see that there is no extra space. 
all the organs are squished together as tight as they can be. Um, and so it's really important that those organs are covered with serous membranes because as your organs move, right, think about it, your heart is beating, it's moving. Your lungs are moving every time you breathe in and out. Your intestines, your stomach, they're all moving. Um, so as all those organs move, the serous membranes make sure that you don't have friction being created, okay? So our serous membranes, the way they're found in the body is you actually have two of them. You have one serous membrane that sits right on top of the organ and another serous membrane that sort of is found within the cavity, the body cavity that that organ is in. And the two of those are separated by fluid. And so you can see in the image down at the bottom, they're trying to show you the heart and it's found within these serous membranes. So you can see, I'm gonna try to draw on this, but we'll see how good it, it works. If I can get right on top, there we go. So I'm gonna color it in red. This is the serous membrane that sits right on top of the heart. And that's called the visceral serosa. So remember, I told you the term viscera means organ. So the visceral serosa just means that it's the serous membrane, the serosa, that's on top of the organ, okay? Then you also have a serous membrane in the cavity. So we call that the parietal serosa. Again, serosa just means serous membrane and parietal means cavity, okay? So parietal serosa is in the cavity. Visceral serosa is the one that's on the organ. And then those two are gonna be separated by fluid called serous fluid. And so you can see in this picture, I drew in red on top of the visceral serosa. Now that blue line on the outside, that is the parietal serosa. And you can see between the two, there is a space. And that space is filled with serous fluid, okay? And that, that is what is really helping to reduce the friction. So as your heart contracts and as it beats, it's not generating a ton of heat. It's not generating a ton of friction because it's found in these serous membranes. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to go one step further um, with our serous membranes. But before I do that, I need to make sure that y'all are okay with your serous membranes. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, good. So we have a membrane in the cavity. We have a membrane on the organ. They're separated by some fluid. Great. And so now let's talk about how we can be a little more specific when we talk about our serous membranes. Okay. Um, so serous membranes actually are given names for the specific cavity or organ that they're associated with. So let me go back to this page here. Um, so you can see the term serosa. Serosa just means serous membrane, and it's very generic. So when I say parietal serosa, you have no idea what serous membrane I'm talking about. You know I'm just talking about one that lines a cavity, okay? And so what we do to be more specific is we take off the word serosa and we replace it with the name of the cavity, right? So an example would be instead of calling it a parietal serosa, we might call it parietal pleura when we're talking about the one that lines the thoracic cavity, the one that is found in the pleural cavity where your lungs would be found. Or we call it a visceral pleura. Okay, we took the word serosa off and replaced it with pleura because now we're talking about the lungs. So notice the terms parietal and visceral stay the same. So parietal means it lines the cavity, but this time we say instead of serosa, pleura. So now we're looking at a serous membrane that lines the cavity that the lungs are in. Visceral, remember, means organ and pleura is lung. So visceral pleura is the serous membrane that's lining the lung themselves, okay? Another example would be parietal and visceral peritoneum. Again, we just took off the word serosa and replaced it with this term. Peritoneum is what we find in the abdominal pelvic cavity. 
And so parietal peritoneum lines the abdominal pelvic cavity. Visceral peritoneum is what's covering the organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay, so we can just get more specific when we talk about our serous membranes by replacing the term serosa with the name of the cavity. Um, and I have some, let me, oh, I don't, um, I don't have any pictures. I thought I had some pictures for you. Um, your lab manual, there are some pictures of these serous membranes. Um, and so you'll have to label those. So I mentioned to you that serous membranes just really reduce friction. Um, and um, they do a really good job as long as the serous membranes are not thick, right? As long as they're not inflamed. If a serous membrane gets, um, a if you get a bacterial infection, um, the serous membrane can swell up. That's a natural process when you get sick is swelling, inflammation. If serous membranes swell up, then what happens, I'm gonna go back to this picture here. If these serous membranes, for example, around the heart got swollen, that space in between those two membranes where you normally have fluid is basically gone and the membranes stick to each other every time the organ moves. That generates friction, it generates heat, and it generates a lot of pain. And so inflammation of your serous membranes causes them to stick together and it causes a lot of pain. And so some examples of this um, imbalance might be something called pleurisy. You may have heard of that before. Pleura means lungs. So pleurisy is when you get inflammation of the pleural cavity in the lungs, around the lungs, and the serous membranes are sticking together, and it causes every time you breathe in and out to be incredibly painful. Peritonitis is another one. So um, peritonitis is happening down in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So remember, peritoneum means abdominal pelvic. So that is causing those serous membranes down in the abdominal pelvic cavity to get swollen and stick together. Things that can cause peritonitis um, might be like a piercing abdominal wound, um, people who have a ruptured appendix. When your appendix ruptures, you leak feces out into your abdominal pelvic cavity and all those bacteria along with it, and it can cause that swelling. Um, you can die from peritonitis. So it is really important that um, if a, a patient has this, they get IV antibiotics immediately. Um, usually both of these cond conditions are treated with antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. It'll take the swelling down and it'll make that pain go away. Okay. A couple of other body cavities that I'll just mention. Um, these are some, most of these that I have listed up here are open to the outside. Um, so oral and digestive cavities. This is basically your mouth. It is the cavity that is opening up into your digestive organs. Again, it's open to the outside. The nasal cavity, um, this is um, part of the respiratory system. It is clearly open to the outside. It's carrying oxygen uh, down into the lungs. Your orbital cavities, these are open to the outside. These house the eyes. And even your middle ear cavity. Um, so the middle ear cavity contains little tiny bones. These are actually the smallest bones in the human body. You have three of them. Um, and these help to transmit sound vibrations so that you can hear sound, but your middle ear is also open to the outside. The very last one at the bottom, synovial cavities. These are the only ones that are not open to the outside. These are joint cavities. Um, we will talk more about these when we get to chapter eight and we uh, talk about joints, but synovial cap, most of your joints are synovial joints. Synovial cavities, these would be like your elbow joint, your joints in between your knuckles, any joint that has a space and fluid in there. Another way you can think about it is if it's any joint that you can crack or pop is a synovial joint, okay? So that's the only one that does not follow that rule of being open to the outside on this page. Here are just some images of these cavities, right? We can see our nasal cavity, right? Um, we can see the oral cavity. Even they're showing you here um, a synovial joint here in between your vertebrae. It's got some fluid in there. 
All right, and then I feel like there are a couple of slides that are missing. Um, the last couple things that I am going to walk you through are some abdominopelvic regions. So where students get a little confused um, in anatomy when we talk about this term region, remember we at the very beginning of the lecture this morning, we were talking about body regions. Let me skip back real quick. I'll show you that picture. So here, right, we have these regional terms. These are our body regions. Okay, so we, these are all over the body. We have some in the front, some in the back. When we talk about abdominopelvic regions, again, pay attention to this first part here, abdominopelvic. These are just the regions of the abdomen. Um, and we do this, we divide the abdomen up into regions because it's such a big area that if somebody, for example, is having pain, a lot of people, when they go into the doctor, they go into the hospital, if they're having pain anywhere in their abdominal pelvic region, what do they say? My stomach hurts. I have pain in my stomach. And that's not necessarily what they mean. They don't mean that their stomach, the organ hurts. They're just saying somewhere in this area. So a doctor would then palpate the abdominal pelvic region. And then the patient would say, oh, right there, that part right there, that hurts. And the doctor would write in the chart exactly what region it is where the patient is experiencing pain. And this is super helpful because within these regions, you can see all the different organs that are found there. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through these nine abdominal pelvic regions um, and talk about why they're named the way they are so that it'll help you remember them. So obviously we're gonna start with rights and lefts. Remember, it's anatomy. So it's the right and left of the patient, okay? So we're gonna start over here on the right side of the patient. So we have the right hypochondriac region. Let's break that word down, okay? So we're gonna start with the term hypo. Does anybody know what that means, hypo? Do it mean like up? Not up, the opposite? Below. Down. Yes, oh, below. below. So remember, it, you probably took general biology maybe in the summer or the spring, and you talked about things like hypotonic, hypertonic. So that prefix hypo means below. Now a prefix you may, or um, a, a, a uh, part of speech you may not be familiar with that you will learn this semester is the second part, chondro. That means cartilage. So literally, hypochondriac means below the cartilage. So you... In this region, this right hypochondriac region, um, what you are looking at, and it's probably hard to tell, um, I'm going to erase this part right here because um, the words are there, but right in here, you've got the ribs, and the ribs in that region are false and floating ribs, and so there's a lot of cartilage in here coming up to the sternum, and so we call this the right hypochondriac region because it's sitting below the cartilage. Let me go to this image and you can see it a lot better. So you can see the actual bones, the ribs here, but notice this area in here where it's sort of see-through, that's all cartilage. So that's why we call that the hypochondriac region. It's all the stuff below that cartilage. Now, same thing with the left hypochondriac region. It's named for the same reason, right? It is the left side below the cartilage. Now in the middle, we have an epigastric region. So let's break these parts of speech down. Epi, does anyone know what that term means? Think epidermis. So epi means above. How about gastric? 
I know you know what that means. The stomach. Yes, ma'am, the stomach. So epigastric literally means above the stomach. So again, let's go to this picture here where we can see the organs underneath, and here is the stomach. So this is the region that is right on top of the stomach. Okay. Now I'm breaking these words down for you. I will do that a lot this semester. If you know a lot of these prefixes and suffixes and root words, it becomes super helpful as we move through the semester because you'll be able to look at the look at the word and sort of figure out what it means. And so I try to do this a lot. I try to break these words down for you. All right, let's move into that middle region, right? So we, again, we have a right of the patient, lumbar region. Lumbar is just the area of your lower back. So you're gonna, we're gonna use this term lumbar a lot, especially when we're talking about vertebrae. You have lumbar vertebrae, they're just the lower back. Okay, so the right lumbar region and a left lumbar region. And then right in the middle, this one should be pretty easy, the umbilical region. Obviously this is named because your belly button is found right there. And that's where your umbilical cord was attached. And then we also have a right and a left iliac region. That term iliac correlates with your hip bones. So, oh, they're not on here. Um, so you can kind of see the hip bones on this person right here. This is my husband, by the way. I'm just kidding. It's not. <laughs> um, you can see the iliac regions. This is the hip bones. So if you can put your hands on your hips and you can kind of feel your hip bones, those are actually called the iliac crests. And so we call these the left and right iliac regions. And then in the lower portion, right in the middle, this is the hypogastric region. Now, I already told you what hypo means, right? It means below. And you know what gastric means? It means stomach. This is clearly well below the stomach. Another term for this, which I like better, is the pubic region. I feel like that's just easier to remember, and it's probably what most of you already use, okay? So those are our nine regions, nine abdominopelvic regions. And again, we would use these, especially when charting. And this is the image that correlates with those nine regions and what organs are found in those nine regions. Okay, and you'll be doing this on the lab. Now the last one kind of goes along with those regions. Another way that we can break up the abdominal pelvic area is instead of doing nine separate regions, we do four quadrants. And the four quadrants are super easy. You just basically draw a cross on the abdomen right through the belly button. And we have a right upper, a left upper, a right lower, and a left lower quadrant. I want you to know the nine regions as well as the four quadrants. It truly depends. I know a lot of you are going into healthcare. Depends on where you work as to what they prefer you use in the chart. So you just need to know both of those. The quadrants are super easy. It might take you a little longer to learn um, those nine regions. Okay. Um, so that is it for the last part of chapter one. Does anyone have any questions on what we went over this morning? Everybody okay? Um, I will tell you, um, so just a reminder for anyone who popped in a little late this morning after we started. Um, so this week, so now you're finished with the chapter one lecture. Hopefully you have already watched the videos that I posted on Monday that went over the, what we would have done on Monday's lecture, but instead we were kind of going over the course. Um, so all of the chapter one PowerPoint now you've got video, you'll have videos for, you've watched. Um, you can go ahead and get started working through your mastering questions for chapter one. They go right along with the lecture for chapter one. Um, and then you also have a lab. You have a PDF document to fill out and a quiz. Um, everything is due by Sunday at 11. And then what we'll do next Monday is we will actually start into our next chapter during the lecture time.
And then right after a lecture on Monday, we will go over the lab from chapter one. So I will pull up the PDF. I will go through all the blanks with you. I will tell you how to remember certain things. I'll give you some tips and tricks. It is really important that if you can't attend that live lab portion on Mondays that you at least go back and watch the video recording because this is how you're going to know what the right answers are on your lab documents because that's what you're going to use to study for your lab exam, okay? Um, your lab exams will be super similar to the lab quizzes that you're doing each week. It's just identification questions. Um, what else did I want to tell you? I feel like there was something else. Maybe not. Oh, um, there is something else. Um, you may have noticed, some of you have may have worked already through chapter one. Um, once you finish chapter one, your chapter four module, the next one will open up. And you might be thinking, what happened to chapters two and three? Um, chapters two and three. Um, chapter two is a chemistry chapter. It is all about um, atoms and molecules and um, bonding, ionic bonding, covalent bonding, hydrogen bonding, you already did this in general biology. We don't have time to do it again. So we are skipping chapter two, the chemistry chapter. Um, same thing with chapter three. Chapter three is all about cells. So it is about cells and organelles, um, mitochondria, DNA, RNA, um, ribosomes. It is all about the parts of cells. You just did that in general biology because general biology is a prereq for anatomy one. And so because you've just done that, we don't have time to go back over it in anatomy. Um, and so we skip those chapters. It's, I'm not saying they're not important. They are. They're especially important as we get into physiology. If you don't know about bonding and if you don't know what atoms and molecules are, when we get into physiology, it's going to make it really tough. I try to remind you as we go through. Um, but I'm not going to test you on anything from chapters two and three. Um, so there's no mastering questions on chapters two and three. You're not tested on chapters two and three. So we just skip right over those and roll into chapter four. So one of the things that um, we talked about at the beginning of chapter one in the recordings that I posted for you is um, we kind of walked through these levels of organization. So how do you take small parts and pieces and build them up to make a whole human? Um, and I told you that we start with atoms and molecules, right? If you take atoms and hook them together, bond them together, you get molecules, which are bigger. Big macromolecules like carbs, lipids, proteins, DNA, RNA, these are what make cells. That's our next level. Cells make tissues. So your book literally goes from through this level of organization. Chapter two is chemistry. Chapter three is cells. Chapter four is tissues. So that is kind of how we're walking through the semester. So our next chapter, chapter four, is just we're going to start off on tissues. Um, I will warn you, chapter four is a long chapter. Um, I think it's fascinating, but most students hate this chapter the most. Um, tissues can be pretty dry, pretty bland. Um, it's looking at a lot of pictures. And so I will do my, my best to simplify it as much as we can as we go through chapter four. I will say that it is a foundational chapter. So for chapter four, we are going to go over all these tissues and you can't just memorize them and forget them because we, I'm going to constantly reference tissues all semester. And then in AP2, same thing. I will constantly be coming back and referencing tissues. So if you don't truly commit these tissues to memory and learn about the tissues, you will struggle through anatomy one and anatomy two because this is a really important foundational chapter. Okay, so that is what's coming up next week, all right? So everything for chapter one is due by Sunday at 11. I do recommend that you don't wait till the last minute. If you do and then you experience issues and you can't get in and you're trying to email me at 9.30 at night on Sunday night, there's probably not much I can do to help you. So try to get your stuff in um, at least Sunday morning so that you're not waiting till the last minute, okay? Anybody have any questions that you can think of? 
Y'all are good? You said we're supposed to order the specimen by today. Yeah, so um, I've had a lot of people asking, do I have to have it really early? Um, if you were a financial aid student and you are waiting on your refund, that's fine. You can wait. You don't have to order it today. My only concern is that if you wait to order these specimens, we don't need to dissect them until after the lab midterm. So it's not even until halfway through the semester that we'll do the dissections. But if you wait to order specimens, you run the risk of the supply company not having them in stock or that they are back ordered. So I really would hate for you to wait till the last minute. Um, but if you want to wait a week or two, I think you'll be fine. I wouldn't wait until, um, you know, a week or two before we dissect, but you could wait a week or two. You definitely need mastering in the e-text today, though. If you have not bought that, you do need that, or a textbook. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Do y'all like doing live lectures? Yeah, I'd rather be in play. I know, me too. But this is the best we got. Is this okay? I figure this might be better than watching recordings, um, but y'all will just yeah. have to let me know. Yeah, it's better than watching recordings. Okay, good, good. So I just, um, you know, y'all are super quiet. It's okay. Nobody can see you, so y'all can talk to me. Um, you know, if you've got questions, if you're not sure as we're moving through, um, this chapter was not a super hard chapter, but feel free as we're lecturing, if you're stuck on something or I went too fast, just stop me and I'll go back, okay? Well, I will see you all again next Monday at 8.30, okay? And if you've got any questions, shoot me a message in Canvas. Bye. Yeah.